and we'll begin to take questions. Thanks a lot, Sean. Is my audio back on, folks? Yes. All right. Um, well, first and foremost, I wanted to back up uh, to um, a question that came in regarding sort of the operational reality of um, build up of manure um, at an intersection at a roadway where you're making routine hauls. So not an actual spill um, or accident, but dealing with um, those incidental spills um, that, that happen uh, as you're dealing with manure. Kevin, did you want to take a, a stab at that as far as recommendation of cleaning that up, dealing with that? Sure. And I think really, Tommy, what we need to be thinking about is there's two separate issues. that we're often dealing with. One is mud and soil, the other is manure. And they need to be handled a little bit differently from an environmental perspective and a PR perspective as well. But if we're dealing primarily with manure, we need to be scraping up those solids and physically removing them <clears throat> as quickly as possible. But realize it's not practical to go out there and scrape after every load goes in and turns and sloshes a little bit. So. What we typically say is on a regular basis, you're out there physically scraping off what you can. If there is quite a bit uh, and you think that there's a safety issue in terms of the traffic on the road, then you're probably going to want to think about a number of the commercial manure applicators in the upper Midwest now have street sweepers uh, as one of their arsenals or the rotating brushes that they put on a PTO. Uh, but if you're going to end up flushing that off with a high pressure wash, you're going to want to make sure that you contain that runoff and uh, land apply it to the field so you don't create a larger incident. If you're dealing with mud or soil, uh, that is a little bit different animal because of the fact that clay soil in particular uh, really tends to make roads slick days or even weeks later if it doesn't rain. And all it takes is a very heavy dew or a light rain to do that. So it becomes more of a safety issue. But our solution is fairly similar. Every <clears throat> so many hours, depending on the amount we're tracking out, physically scrape that off. We can sweep or flush it into a ditch. I think one of the key things in either case is we want to look at slowing down the uh, citizen traffic if we can. And a lot of our townships and counties don't want to provide signs that say mud on road or something like that because then they're uh, admitting some liability and it can open the township or the county up to a legal claim. But signs more on the lines of trucks entering highway or slow are probably more appropriate and in a lot of cases can be borrowed from your local government officials. Great. Thanks, Kevin. I, ho I hope that that um, uh, gets that, gets that uh, answer taken care of. Um, I had another question that, that I'd like to field myself regarding, is there any advice out there, especially for producers, when, um, say, the 5 o'clock news shows up at the site of an accident? Um, obviously, uh, it would help to have some sort of idea uh, of, of who is going to be able to speak to, uh, speak to the media. In the situation where the owner operator may be trying to deal with and manage uh, the response and, and recovery, um, then that leaves a gap in that communications role. Um, perhaps it's the certified planner uh, or the, the technical service provider that worked with that producer on their nutrient management plan, on their manure management plan, which, as I mentioned in the introduction, would likely have an emergency plan as well um, because it's required for NRCSC and MPs and it's required in permitting. So. If the planner could step in there and make a very simple statement that this uh, contingency uh, was provided for in the emergency plan, uh, the operating plan for that operation, that you know it was being handled, um, really ag communicators advise um, short statements um, that can be backed up, such as there is a plan for this situation, is really what needs to be continually emphasized to the press. Um, other persons who may be able to fill that role and may also have a vested interest in uh, reducing the, the, the PR and liability with the agricultural emergency could be your ag lender, your ag insurance agent, um, 
Farm Bureau uh, locally or in the region may have somebody uh, who could make a statement, somebody perhaps who is already trained in, um, in handling those sorts of situations. Local emergency preparedness committees have public information officers. Um, they are very well versed in, in providing statements to the general public and the press. So a producer or a group of producers could approach their um, local emergency preparedness committee, not only to incorporate agriculture into that local plan, but also to benefit from, say, this public information officer who would be part of that committee. Um, we recommend in some cases um, that uh, producers uh, have an environmental policy statement, something very short uh, that they can provide to um, persons in a situation like this where there's an emergency. It just says what their farm is about, what they produce, um, that they follow all rules and regulations uh, and have a stewardship ethic. This statement is no more than, say, three sentences, but it's something that can be provided until a later date when, when follow-up. So an environmental policy statement or some sort of emergency statement uh, could be advisable. So those are just some suggestions on, on the PR front, dealing with the news. Um, I will make uh, another plug that many ag communication departments at land-grant universities, as well as extension services, um, have folks who are trained in emergency communication for agricultural situations. So producers could reach out to them ahead of time and have um, press and PR as part of their emergency plan. Um, Kevin, uh, well, first I want to remind folks to answer the, the polling pods that are popping up on your screen. If, if you miss them, um, we can get them back up. But Kevin, would you like to share or discuss um, the map view that we can see in the background in this emerging resource? Right. One of the things that has come up as a need that we identify as we put this together is sort of a one-stop shop where you can find out what the reporting requirements are, whether you are um, dealing with a AFO, a CAFO permitted by the state, by EPA, not by EPA, et cetera. And so what we have done is put together a map here and I do want to thank Leslie Johnson at Nebraska for spending a whole lot of time working on that here over the past couple of hours or so, actually the past 24 hours or so. And um, at this point I'm not able to get that map to come up interactively so I'll ask um, one of the folks uh, to bring that up if they could either as a web link or um, as a live map as I don't have the address available to me here at this point. But basically what um, this resource, which is going to be on the eExtension website, will do is you can click on a particular state and you'll be able to see exactly uh, what your reporting requirements are, the number of hours for that verbal report, the written report that we talked about earlier. Uh, some of the states we have a whole lot of information. For other states we only have a very small amount. So if we can get that to come up here in the next minute or so, we'll go ahead and show folks. Otherwise, that'll be one of the resources that will be available on the eExtension website. So why don't we go ahead, somebody brought it up there and they clicked on Nebraska. And what you'll see there is the technical information that we got from the um, regulatory authorities in Nebraska. You'll look in the third paragraph. It says that verbal reports are required within 24 hours written reports completed within five days. <clears throat> the next paragraph down there has the state manure spill hotline and also a separate number for other spills. So diesel, uh, hazardous waste, all other spills are going to that other number. And um, there's also the after hours number listed there as well. I'll go ahead and have you click on Wisconsin now as sort of the next state. Uh, just an example of what we might have for just the basics. In this case, the only thing we have up for Wisconsin currently is the spills hotline, which is used for spills of any kind. But over the next few weeks and months, we hope to be getting data in from all 50 states with those reporting requirements. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Um, Sean, I see that you've tackled a question or two over in the chat box regarding um, staff gauges um, 
any reminders or, or concluding comments or tips uh, regarding uh, being able to um, measure that liquid storage uh, capacity with some sort of gauge? Uh, yeah, I just did want to make one comment is that frequently what we what we do in Tennessee is we'll put a, a staff gauge in that will that will be basically a readout of the total volume or total depth and then we'll have a marker on that that'll be really the required marker for the for the for the pump down event and, and maintenance of the of this of the storm event volume and that's what you see uh, on the left in the in the picture from uh, that had been provided by the University of Wisconsin so. Uh, I believe as the rule reads that you simply need a marker to know when the pump down event occurs, but my advice would be to put in a gauge that you can translate into uh, into volume. I think another tip too, I like to see um, a physical marker, meaning not just um, painted numbers uh, on a wall, uh, on a post, but for example, uh, if, if the gauge itself was a steel post, actually welding on cross hatches um, that represented different levels because once uh, once they get covered in, in manure, uh, those nice looking numbers and stripes all disappear. So um, if you want to remove washing the staff gauge from your list of chores, you can use uh, physical markers, some something that's welded to that, uh, that post that's visible. Well, folks, um, I'm not sure if, if I've missed anything from the chat box. Um, any other questions that have come in? Did any of our presenters notice anything that I've missed? I guess not. With that, um, I'll remind everybody the archived webcast will be up soon. Um, that is at www.extension.org and you can click from the menu for Animal Manure Management. That is our community in the eExtension system. Uh, likewise, Kevin's resource will also be linked there that we're developing. And if anybody is a participant today, happens to see their state not represented, and they can help us provide that information, uh, please get in touch with us. So, with that, I want to thank Kevin especially as our coordinator today. Uh, the staff at Nebraska and Iowa State on the technical end of things, Sean and Melanie, our other speakers. And uh, all of you, the participants, remember, if you want to continue discussions, you can visit the Ning site. And uh, with that, I'd say good afternoon. And thank you. Thank you.